All right, here we are with Rian from the Flow Research Collective. And before we go into everything, quick reminder that you can ask us questions in the comment and me and my team are in the comments answering all your questions. Personally, I'm very excited about this talk because I have a tradition of running marketing events and then having a lifestyle stream on them. And so I'm very excited that we talk about the power of flow states, about peak performance with Rian whom I've met when working together in marketing and who is a co-founder of the Flow Research Collective, which is one of the leading organizations in flow research, an organization that I'm deeply inspired by and that also led to me naming my company Flow SEO. So it's a topic very near and dear to my heart. Rian, very excited to have you here. Thank you for joining. Thank you for having me, Viola. It's great to be here. And uh, yeah, I miss working together. I miss working together. You did some amazing work in your time with us. People can check out Flow Research Collective Radio, which you basically single-handedly built from scratch. So um, yeah, it's great to great to be here and great to see you again. I really appreciate that. Perfect. Uh, Rian, for some context, you have an interesting journey. You basically straight out of of, out of, of college, out of university, started working in marketing, started working with some phenomenal people, build up some websites. Can you give us like a two minute rundown on how it came about that you are the co-founder of the Flow Research Collective? Sure. Yeah, I'll try and be as fast as possible and I'll touch on the marketing stuff. So um, when I was 13, I had a head injury and that caused seven years of debilitating symptoms. Essentially, my whole teen years got blown up with chronic fatigue, amnesia, blurred vision. Was, I was totally dysfunctional and looking for ways to, to solve that. And whilst looking for ways to recover from that, that injury uh, and get back to a state of baseline performance and functioning, um, I actually came across Stephen Kotler talking about optimal performance, optimal functioning, peak states of consciousness and flow specifically. And that resonated incredibly deeply because I was in you know, the exact opposite of flow, not able to even think or remember the name of some of my close friends at the time. So I started following Stephen, reached out to him um, and was inspired by his work on flow and peak performance and the neuroscience based approach to it. And then started to gear my career around that in part and ended up pursuing sort of two dual tracks. One was academic focusing on uh, neuroscience. I did a, did a BA in, in philosophy with a focus on neurophilosophy and philosophy of mind and then a master's in neuroscience. And then in parallel with that, um, I was deep into sales actually before marketing. Mm, so right. all sorts of- I'm not surprised at all. <laughs> <laughs> I had all sorts of hideous, hideous sales jobs from uh, multi-level marketing, selling aloe vera in college. Mm. Um, and I became known a little bit too much as the aloe vera salesman on campus in Trinity College in Dublin. So that wasn't, that wasn't great, but it was incredibly educational from a sales perspective. Uh, sold websites by cold calling, sold alarms door to door, knocking on doors, um, sold charities door to door. Um, and so sales was was sort of the, the initial gateway into growth overall from a business perspective. And I was doing that in parallel with studying these very highfalutin academic topics. So in the evenings, I'd be sort of selling door to door with these hustler types. Uh, and then in the mornings, I'd be reading about philosophy of mind and the history of philosophy and things like that, which was a fun, interesting contrast. And then after that, as I started to ramp up my work with Stephen, I got into marketing, but it but it was right. the segue was sales. Right. Amazing. Yeah. And uh, I mean, Stephen and especially uh, uh, his books, um, The Rise of Superman and Stealing Fire largely inspired my path as well and how I think about life. And before we go any deeper, what is actually a flow state? Yeah, it's a great question. So the simplest way to describe a flow state is to say that it is being in the zone, which everyone has experienced at one point or another. So if anyone listening to this has ever said to themselves or said to someone else, you know, I was able to drop into the zone so well today and I got a ton of work done or I got into my groove and time went by faster than it normally does. That is a flow state. That is a, an experience of peak performance or flow within which all sorts of different performance outcomes increase from creativity to learning to productivity to um, skill acquisition and a number of other variables. So a flow state is a state of optimal performance. And it's distinct. People often ask, what's the difference between flow and focus? 
Right. Focus does not imply a physiological shift. With a flow state, there's mm -hmm. a physiological shift that occurs across a number of different dimensions. There are psychological attributes that are unanimous for you know anyone in any different activity or task when in a right. flow state, like the loss of sense of self or self-consciousness, the, the merger of action awareness, the time dilation, so hours going by and what feels like minutes or vice versa. There's also um, neurobiological shifts that we believe are occurring, like decreased activation of the prefrontal cortex, which is often described as transient hyperfrontality. And then there are, there are neurochemical shifts that are occurring. So increases in uh, dopamine, serotonin, endorphins, anandamide, um, and norepinephrine, we believe are correlated to a flow state. And those sorts of physiological and psychological shifts do not necessarily occur when we are merely focused on something. Right. And I think, like you said, in the zone, I know for me, a flow state is a lot related to doing yoga, practicing yoga, dancing is a big one for me. And so often when we think about flow state, we might be thinking about our hobbies, our passion. I know you and a lot of people from your team are into action sports, into skiing, into surfing. But I'm interested, what does it mean flow in a work context? And how, how, how do we achieve flow states in a work context without all the fun stuff of nature and waves and music? Um, how do we get there? Yeah, we'll have to follow up on the dancing point, Viola. I didn't know you were a dancer. Curious what type. Um, but uh, so to your point, there are activities that are inherently high flow. These are activities mm -hmm. that are embedded with lots of flow triggers, which are the preconditions right. for being able to access a flow state. And those triggers are just in the activity. So we don't even have to think about trying to get into flow when doing these things because there are inherently triggers within those activities. So just to give you an example, you mentioned surfing, let's say. So there are roughly 21 flow triggers that have been identified. And these are psychological triggers, environmental triggers, creative triggers, and actually even group triggers that show up. And when they show up, your likelihood of being able to access flow increases. And so when surfing, you have risk, which is a flow trigger. You have novelty, complexity, unpredictability. You're riding down a wave and the ocean is changing in real time as you're surfing it. So within those sorts of activities, get accessing flows is much easier, which is why we like doing those activities as hobbies as a general rule. When it comes to the workplace, more intentionality is needed to be able to identify flow triggers and then actively embed them in your way of working or in your job role or in your department or function or culture or whatever the case may be. And so I know we were talking a little bit about marketing earlier on. And I think one of the reasons that people gravitate towards online marketing and why digital marketing has blown up. And I, I feel like, at least in our world, the majority of people that I meet start out in some form of online marketing. They have a marketing agency or they do marketing for someone. It's just incredibly common. Um, and one of the reasons, obviously, is that it's, it's arguably you know, a really good way to monetize the skill because it's, it's driving revenue directly. But I think also there's a flow component. Mm. Immediate feedback is one of the big triggers for flow that Mihai Csikszentmihalyi is often referred to as the godfather of flow identified in the 1960s in his original research. The three big triggers were challenge skills balance, which is ensuring that there's an optimal ratio between the challenge level of the task you're doing and your existing skill level. If the challenge is too high, you become overstimulated and anxious. If the challenge is too low, you become understimulated and bored. When the challenge level of the task you're doing is just slightly above your current skill set, that's the sweet spot for flow. So that's the first trigger that he identified, and it's the most well-researched in flow. Another one is clear goals, which is fairly straightforward. We can talk about it if you'd like. And then the other one, which brings us back to marketing, is immediate feedback, which is receiving feedback as quickly as possible from any action you're taking. Um, and so feedback is essentially just information. And the more, the more rapidly you are given information relative to the action you're taking, the higher the immediate feedback, the more likely you are to get into flow. So to give you a classic example, video gaming. When you're playing with a video game, you, know, you press one button and instantly the controller vibrates, noises are made out of the PlayStation or Xbox, things, scores come up on the screen, and then a massive image comes up. So you're getting all these sources of information instantaneously 
the second you take an action like pressing a button on the controller and that's a that's a form of very high immediate feedback which is one of the reasons video games are so high flow and addictive arguably as well due to that um but i think in online marketing there's a similar effect metrics marketing is, is so heavily metrics based and you know you launch a webinar or a new facebook ad or a new article if it's seo or whatever the case may be and thanks to the way digital marketing works now and data we're able to get immediate feedback very very quickly and lots of it uh, which i think makes marketing higher flow arguably than other uh, professions especially if it's online marketing or direct response marketing versus brand marketing which arguably brand marketing is lower flow than direct response marketing so I, I was about to say, I think in terms of like immediate feedback, probably SEO is one of the worst because you get, gotta wait a, a patient a few weeks or months for things to kick in. But 100% I agree with you. And the other thing is I used to be gaming a lot as a teenager. And really? I say about marketing often, it is gaming just with a worse interface because the spreadsheet is not yeah. as exciting as computer games. Used to be, it. But it has, has that feedback, it has that level up. And to your point about the challenge skill ratio is the platforms are evolving so fast. What was working six months ago is not working anymore today. Instagram, I don't know, it's, it's launching reels. You need to adapt. Now you're publishing reels. LinkedIn has the lives now or LinkedIn really likes the carousel posts right now. So all of a sudden your text posts from last year might not have the same performance. So you constantly need to adapt and tweak and that probably helps with staying on the challenge skill ratio and never getting bored and never doing the same thing twice as well. A hundred percent. Yeah. Mihai Csikszentmihalyi has a model for flow that has the challenge skills balance baked into it. And we call it the stairway to flow. And it shows you that over the length of, let's say a year or even over a longer period of time, like over the entirety of a career, what, what happens is you, um, your skill level increases and adapts to the challenge of the task. And you actually get too good at what it is that you're doing and you can drop out of flow. But right. then if you persist and you continue doing that thing, eventually new challenges are going to emerge. Instagram's going to change their algorithm. Google's going to mess with SEO. A new marketing channel that's dominant is going to pop back up. And all of a sudden the challenge level goes back up above your skill level and you get back into the sweet spot for flow again. And that sort of that stairway effect tends to occur over the length of a of a career or a role or even just within a year and sometimes even within a quarter when it's a fast adapting environment and i think one of the important takeaways for people there also is to persist even if they drop out of flow for certain periods of time and they're finding they're less stimulated doing what it is they're doing right the mistake I think a lot of people make is they go back to the start or they try do so, they try and do something completely new or different right. because they think it'll be more novel and more of a challenge and they'll get into flow as a result of it. But rather than doing that, persisting with the existing skill and, and focusing on progression, knowing right. that you may not be in a, a period of flow right now, but the challenges will naturally emerge again and you will get back in flow again. That tends to be a better way to ride out the path to mastery than constantly resetting the process and building new skills rather than mastering one skill right. and, and sort of just being content with the fact that flow happens in a staircase like fashion where you you lose it you get it again you lose it you get it again amazing i think that's 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 very helpful information to to clarify that process the other thing i wanted to bring up assuming you know it's 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 too easy too boring that maybe drops us out of flow or doesn't inspire us to drop into flow. However, I also think marketing has some qualities that can be quite the flow blockers in the sense that if we're a social media manager, we get constant notifications on all kinds of platforms. People are constantly writing us. We get emails and newsletters on end. Um, we have maybe one too many dashboards to look at. So in my experience, one of the things that holds me back from having a flow experience during work is notifications, distractions, uh, jumping around tasks, uh, constant multitasking, and especially in marketing, trying to keep up with something really sometimes leads to a state of like stress instead of flow. And so 
I know that you talk about flow blockers. Maybe you can explain what are some of them and then how do we, you know, stop them from blocking us dropping into flow and how can we set up our workplace to be more conducive to flow specifically? Sure. Yeah, it's a great question. And, and I think you're dead right that the other side, the marketing being high flow, that's also very highly distracting in part because of the immediate feedback that we right. get through through notifications and things like that. So it's a double edged sword. So Nassim Taleb, who is a sort of a modern day philosopher and risk analysis um, and wrote a book, I'm sure pretty much everyone listening to will have heard of at least which is called anti-fragile. He talks about a concept called via negativa, which is the idea that it is beneficial in most systems to remove before adding, if you want to produce mm -hmm. a result. So if you're trying to get in shape rather than adding in supplements, try and just remove the crap that you're eating, for example. Yeah. Um, and I think the same thing applies to flow, where it's more effective to remove the things that are impeding flow, as at, mm -hmm. at least as an initial first step, than to try and add in fancy things that are going to drive flow. And we see this all the time with our clients where people are getting, you know, four and a half hours of terrible sleep, but then right. waking up in the morning and using some kind of fancy brain headset to try and enhance their meditation practice. And it, right. you know, it doesn't necessarily stack. Um, so I think the same thing applies to, to the flow blockers. And in many ways, we are naturally evolutionarily adapted for flow. Our physiology wants us to drop in flow, but we block right. that from happening, we block that natural process from happening. And one of the biggest things that blocks that natural process from happening is distraction. And there are two forms of distraction. There's um, internal, there are internal forms of distraction, emotions, pain, sensations, things like that. And then there are external forms of distraction people are a big one especially if you're working in an office that's not optimally set up tech is a, is a massive external form of distraction and removing at least the external forms of distraction which also tend to exacerbate the internal forms of distraction like our emotions is a great first step and so what i generally recommend um, to people there is to block every single notification they possibly can and to switch it from the state of constant always on availability to the way things used to be where someone had to actually you know reach you um rather than you being in this state of kind of constantly reachable um right. and so that's a first just simple step which is to just clear all the notifications on your phone on your laptop on your desktop so that your work which may well require those notifications shifts from reactive to proactive. So that you can batch in those kinds of distracting tasks that have lots of stimuli in them rather than getting kind of constantly fragmented by them throughout the day. So it's a simple, just one simple thing people can do and, and definitely should do. And I think there's another point there around batching work. The more you can batch and separate out work, the better. So for example, if you've got to write marketing copy that takes you, you know, a lot of, flow time and, and prolonged focus, it is definitely a good idea to do that as a singular batch of work mm -hmm. that is distinct from the, you know, checking in on all your ad campaigns, for example, it's right. gonna kind of pull your attention all over the place. So batching work as much as possible is helpful too. Agreed. Yeah, I've made it a habit to log out of all the social media platforms. So I, I, I use Facebook or I use LinkedIn and then I actually log out. So it doesn't just sit there and tries to lure me in with a with a new one on the tab um, and just it's, it's kind of off and I found that very helpful. I know that you also have a pretty um, strict um, calendar when it comes to calls, etc. Can you talk about that a little bit being available for calls, which I think especially I mean, as an agency, obviously, I speak with clients, but also if you're in house, you speak with your team, you as a manager, right, you have an entire team underneath you, how do you handle calls and the way they can fragment your day and and your attention yeah it's a great question so what drives me personally more nuts than anything is if i see what i call the swiss cheese schedule uh, on my calendar actually that that is not coined by me that, that was shane on our team who you know and really? um, yep. he describes it as a swiss cheese calendar which is kind of the worst possible case scenario where you've got a half an hour call a 15 minute block a one hour call a 30 minute block you know, two hours of calls, 45 minutes. 
45 minutes off, that, that is just a train wreck because your ability to ramp up into flow takes time. And I'll touch right. on the flow cycle here to articulate that. Flow actually happens in one stage of a four stage cycle. The first stage is struggle. The second stage is release. The third stage is the actual flow state itself. And then the fourth stage on the back end is recovery. And being able to access flow consistently and reliably is actually less about how long we spend in flow and more about how quickly and effectively we can move ourselves through that cycle. But the thing is, it takes a while to move through the first two steps of that cycle, the struggle phase and the release right. phase. And so if you have a 30 minute block to do a deep work task, like writing marketing copy or you know building out a whole new campaign or something like that, you're probably going to, within that 30 minute period, just be tickling the edge of flow Mm. and then have to go back into a call and you and then you you know finish that call and you've got another 20 minutes or 45 minutes and you can start that deep work again and you're probably going to start to just get to the release phase before flow and then bang call happens again and it gets reset right. so that's what happens to people in the in the scenario of a swiss cheese schedule is they just are in this perpetual struggle phase Right. without a, a long enough period of time to be able to persist through the struggle phase, transition into a release phase, and then actually drop into the flow state itself. So mo a longer period of time is sort of non-linearly more impactful than shorter periods of time. Four hours in one block arguably is five times as good as four hours broken up into six blocks throughout the day right. because of the way your physiology works. It takes a while to adapt to the task and, and get into flow. So the first thing I always recommend people do is to just avoid a Swiss cheese schedule like the plague. And um, even if you are managing people, even if you've got lots of calls that you have to do with clients, whatever the case may be, just again, applying the same batching process and trying to do calls back to back as much as possible within one big block. And then keep the mornings free if that's where you tend to be most productive and be able to access flow most or the evenings free if that is what your sort of chronobiology is most optimally adapted to. And the other thing that a lot of people find very helpful in addition to that is also doing the same thing on a daily basis. So only taking calls on maybe Mondays and Fridays, for example, and having Wednesday, Thursday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, mixing up the days of the week there, um, completely free for, for deep work and for flow. Because again, Paul Graham, who's the founder of Y Combinator and just a great sort of first principles thinker, his blog, it's just paulgraham.com, is definitely worth checking out. And he talks about the maker-manager schedule um, which is essentially the same principle of batching your maker, creative, deep work flow time and right. your manager time, which often is also very high leverage time. It's just a different type of flow and it's still extremely important. And if people are managing a team, most of your leverage and impact is probably actually going to come through the make the manager part of your maker manager schedule. So it's also important to bear that in mind. I think where people also go wrong, especially if they start out as creatives and sort of they build their businesses initially as kind of the primary workhorse with lots of helpers rather than building teams where they can tend to go wrong is to actually over index on their own access to flow and their own deep work rather than being a an orchestra conductor for their team who mm -hmm. is actually, you know, going to be most benefited by spending time and flow. So if, you know, there's a certain point at which when your team is a certain size, you may actually experience less flow and that may right. be the right thing because fl flow is not synonymous with leverage either. What is highest right. leverage is often actually not highest flow for you as an individual. And, and again, where a lot of people go wrong is they seek individual flow in the sense of satisfaction and dopamine they get from completing a task themselves. Right. And that feels great, but if you've got 10 team members who are all working suboptimally, you're, you're wasting you know, 400 hours a week of leverage if your team of 10 are all working 40 hours a week. So it's important to be conscious of that balance as well. Yeah, I really appreciate you saying that because it essentially means enabling your team to experience flow can be one of the exactly. things that really puts your company forward. So everything that we're discussing in terms of notifications, uh, time blocks, calls, equally appears 
to to your team right and so if if you have the rule for yourself that you don't want to be constantly interrupted it probably also should be a rule that you are not constantly interrupting the team when they're trying to have a focus period and trying to get something done right yeah and there's an argument to be made that again at a certain team size you should actually be the one person who is getting constantly interrupted and who is okay with that and where things are designed for you to again the analogy i always like is the orchestra conductor and the musicians you know you're supposed right. to be at a certain point of, of leadership and team size you're not supposed to be playing an instrument you're not supposed right. to be executing the work in flow yourself you're supposed to be conducting the orchestra and right. helping each of those individual musicians or individual contributors on your team get into flow rather than you prioritizing your flow instead of right. orchestra conducting the whole team Great point. And so to another point, right? If you have the capability to put your team into flow or not, we briefly touched before we, we um, uh, went, went live is um, how do we actually put prospects and customer and clients into flow with our marketing tactics? And should we, like, how does it look like when it works? And then should we, should we what are the considerations around this? So inducing a state and then and then selling aggressively is is something to avoid when it comes to flow and and that's one extreme example there are other examples that are potentially a little bit lighter uh, other sort of self-help gurus will kind of pump up their audiences and then upsell like crazy with scarcity and urgency and all that and not that there's anything necessarily wrong with scarcity and urgency i think it's you can still deploy those in, in ways that are ethical but the state change piece, the intentional state change as a way to increase close rate or conversion is where people run into danger from an ethical perspective, I believe. Now, in terms of ethically getting your prospects into flow, I think in many ways that's actually critical. Um, mm -hmm. The best marketing copy tends to induce a low grade flow state when you read it. Yeah. It's, it's incredibly compelling. You kind of get pulled into the screen and you get that sense of, action and awareness merging where you're sort of just absorbing the copy and thinking about the benefits and how your life's going to be changed as a result of it and the sense of buying is quest like there's no question about the fact that it makes sense to buy um right. so i do think you know good copywriters tend to naturally induce flow good vsl creators and, and webinar mm -hmm. creators tend to naturally induce flow in the way they talk and present and the use right. of cliffhangers and various strategies like that and i depends on the degree to which you push it but um you know th there's a there's a certain minimum amount of flow that i think you actually may need to induce in a prospect in right. order for your copy to be optimally effective um but it, it ha where do you draw the line of pushing that too far that is the ethical question that i'm still not fully clear on honestly yeah yeah that makes sense. Yeah, I, 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 I do think, like you said, especially video, uh, blog posts, podcasts, we do want to be sucked into. We do want to forget time for a bit and, and we do want that picture to, to be painted for us. And I agree with that. With this also kind of talking about time speeding by faster than, than, than you do appreciate. We, we've hit the 30 minutes mark and, um, I want to give you the opportunity, firstly, if you have any final words or considerations or tips that you would like to give people in regards to understanding flow states, please do so. And then also let people know where can they learn more about you? Where can they learn more about your organization and where do they stay up to date? Sure. So I'll kind of combine those. Um, so flowresearchcollective.com is where you can find us. And we have a tab on that website called learn and all our free content, including Viola, your podcast, Flow Research right. Collective Radio is on there. So uh, people can learn more there. And then if they'd like to train with us, our main training is zero to dangerous. And you can also, there's a big button on the website as well that says apply to train or something like that. So you can right. submit an application and, and book a call with our team. If that's something that's of interest as well. Yeah, I mean, I definitely restructured my my workday a lot after after learning from you and Stephen, and I write my to do list every every day uh, every night for the next day, and I I have actually Monday and Friday off, and I take calls in the weekend afternoons, etc. But you have incredibly tools to offer, and I recommend for people to to check it out and and learn from you.